Good morning, Saints of Orange. Are you tired? Are you cold? So, let's just go ahead and start this morning by apologizing to you. The heat's officially broken. I don't know what's going on. I'm sorry. I can tell you that Philip and Eric and those folks who are, uh, who are here and are responsible for the facilities are working overtime to try to get the problem fixed, but uh, it's probably going to be tomorrow before uh, the heat can get fixed because people work on Mondays. You can't get them to come in on Sunday. But here's the cool thing, two things. In order to stay warm, there's a couple things you can do. Number one is you can snuggle up to the person beside you. You know, wherever you came with this morning, wherever you brought, we're in one big happy family of God, so it's okay. <laughs> These guys are cuddling in the front, that's interesting. <laughs> Uh, but the other thing that you can do is you can make sure that you get physically involved in worship this morning. You gotta sing, you gotta clap, you gotta move around a little bit in order to stay warm. And it's not this way in your bulletins, but we actually flip the first and the last song so that you can start with our fast song this morning so that we can get a little bit of energy for So stand on up. Let's do this. Start by moving your shoulders, you gotta move your feet a little bit. You can clap your hands if you want to. Let's lift our voice this morning. Heavy praise. Here we go. Heavy praise is to our God. Here we worship with one on four. Sing it out. Heavy praise. Heavy praise is to our God. Sing to him this morning. Sing hallelujah to our God. Glory hallelujah is to our God. And praise, and praise is to our God. Sing it again, every praise. And praise is to our God. Every word of worship is one of Yes, he is. Yes, he is. 
Amen. 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 Are you warmer yet? Good. I have a one shake of head and some nod. So here's a general, here's my like deep thought for you, okay? Whenever you get cold in life, lift your voice and worship the Lord and it'll warm you up. Bam. You guys can have a seat. We've got some announcements for you.
You try. I will worship you like he heart and mind and soul will see. I will worship. says, Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrows cease. That's a blessing to me. That's important to me. Over the last few weeks, uh, over the last month or so, I've just been doing a lot of practicing on my own. Some of you may have seen me kind of lurking in the basement in the choir and working on piano stuff or working on guitar. I've just got some, some musical things that I need to work on. But practicing helps me think because it kind of clears my mind. And when your mind is clear, there's all these things that kind of bubble up to the surface that you might not think about otherwise. And so I'm sitting there and I'm running my riffs and my scales or whatever, and I think about things in my life that I'm proud of and things that I'm excited about. And then I think about things that I've done that I'm not so proud of or relationships that I've damaged that I wish I could fix somehow. I'm worried about the future. I'm stressing about whether I'll ever get to where I want to be in, in one way or the other in life. And so to be able to sing a lyric that says, Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids my sorrows cease, is a blessing to me. Because in the midst of all that stuff that's rattling around in my mind, God said, you know what? You're doing it again. You're doing that thing where you take all the good stuff and all the bad stuff and you put it on a scale. And if you kind of come out this way on top that you feel like you're doing okay, Raise your hand. Don't let it be just me. Come on. Get my back. That's better. The rest of you are liars. That's okay. But here's the thing, guys. God said, my grace is covering your life. It's not about what you do anymore. It's not about how good you can be. It's not about getting the good stuff higher than the bad stuff. And I realized the only thing that I've ever done right in my life is accept Jesus Christ to guide me and to rule my life. I can't even do that without his help. So today as we play this next song, this cornerstone, I want to invite you, I want to encourage you this morning. If you haven't done that most important thing and putting Jesus Christ right in the center of your world, you got to get that right. Don't worry about the good and the bad and all the other stuff. Without Jesus, what's the point? This is Cornerstone this morning. Say that. 
who understood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humble, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Love is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. It's good to be seen. It is good to be seen. But Paul told me I need to turn around and look at something real quick. Oh, very nice. I like that. Thank you, brother. Paul does a great job for us on the phone slide. Let's give it up. For us neo Luddites, it's good to have somebody who knows what to do with you. I know enough to mess one up. That's about all I have. Uh, one of the only shows that I watch on network television anymore. There's a show called The Big Bang Theory. Anybody know the Big Bang Theory? <laughs> Love Big Bang Theory. And it's a, it, those of you who don't watch it, it's a, it's a show, it's a comedy, that centers on the lives of four young uh, scientists who work at Caltech. One of them is a guy named Sheldon Cooper. Uh, Sheldon is extremely intelligent, and he's very knowledgeable of that fact and very prideful of it. Often he will lord his intelligence over all of his friends, and sometimes that can lead to embarrassing results. Uh, in season one, there was an episode, episode 13, entitled The Bat Jar Conjecture. In that episode, Sheldon is persuaded by his friends to become part of a physics bowl team. He's going to compete there at Caltech. However, he wants to answer all the questions because he's the smartest one, of course. And this upsets his friends. They get rid of him. Well, Sheldon decides he's going to prove a lesson. He goes out, recruits a, a bunch of folks just to sit there, and he single-handedly proceeds to take them on in this physics bowl competition. Well, let's see what happens next. Hey, I need your answer. Yes, it is minus eight by alpha. Hang on, hang on a second. That's not our answer. What are you doing? Answering question. Winning physics bowl. <laughs> How do you know anything about physics? Here I am janitor in former Soviet Union. I am physicist. And then the polytechnic. Go polar bears. <laughs> That's a delightful little story, but our arrangement was that you sit here and not say anything. I answer the questions. You didn't answer the question. Hey, look! Now, maybe you have democracy now in your beloved Russia, but on this physical team, I rule with an iron fist. Ow! <laughs> hey, hey, I need your official answer. Well, it's not what he said. Then what is it? I want a different question. You can't have a different question. Formal protest. Denied. Informal protest. <laughs> Denied. I need your official answer. No, I declined to provide one. Well, that's too bad, because the answer your teammate gave was correct. <laughs> that's your opinion. <laughs> All right, the winner of the match is... Sheldon, is proving that you are single-handedly smarter than everyone else so important that you would rather lose by yourself than win as part of a team? I don't understand the question. <laughs> Go ahead. The winner is PMS! <laughs> There's no denying Sheldon's intelligence, yet it wasn't enough to help him win, was it? His condescension in regarding others around him as intellectually inferior prevented him from receiving the help he needed. He thought his intelligence would be enough to sway the judge to rule in his favor. And yet, it didn't happen that way, and so Sheldon was robbed of being made right, in a sense, if you will. Now let me ask you this. How many of you like to be right? Uh, in your academic endeavors? Uh, in your fantasy sports picks? Uh, in your pursuits and work, in your 
discussions with your significant others. How many of you like to be right? I mean, it's important to be right, don't you think? It's an important thing. And, uh, it's, an, it's an important thing to be right. And that's true even in a spiritual sense, especially in a spiritual sense. How is it that you and I can be right before God? Well, this is what Jesus is talking about in the passage that Heaven just read to you. In this passage, Jesus tells a parable about two men who went to a temple to pray. One is a Pharisee, the other is a publican or a tax collector. Now these are pretty stock characters from the gospel stories. The Pharisees are well known for their piety and acts of devotion. The publicans are equally well known for their deceitfulness and for their selfishness. Now the fact that a Pharisee went to the temple to pray that's not a big deal. That's standard operational procedure for a good person of God. The publican, on the other hand, probably tried to just creep in the back as easily as could, hopefully not being seen by anybody, maybe not even by God himself. Once inside, the two began to pray, and the, the nature of their prayers are diametrically opposed to one another, and I think they reveal something about the spiritual nature of these men. What should have been a time of worship and communion for this pious Pharisee instead turned into a time for him to congratulate God and himself for how good he was. To give his spiritual resume to God and whoever else was listening. And to, by way of comparison, throw a few tisks, tisks, tisks and derision and condemnation toward that right center on the back pew. The publican, on the other hand, couldn't even lift up his head. All he could do was to confess the error of his ways and ask for the mercy of God. Well, we know where this is going, don't we? Here's the twist, though. Jesus tells us that it is not the righteous Pharisee, but the publican, the poster child of sinfulness, that went home that day justified, made right before God. All of God's people said, hmm, what's going on here? The key to understanding this passage is found in verse 9. Verse 9 says this, He, meaning Jesus, told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. What Jesus is talking about here is nothing less than the very nature and implications of justification, of being made right before God in our life. Now what is it about justification you and I need to understand? What is, about, what is it about being right before God we need to know? Well, clearly if we look at the story, we can see that we're not justified by outdoing others. That's not the way to justification. We're not justified by outdoing other people. It should be noted that the devotional practices of the Pharisees in and of themselves are not being held up to scrutiny here, but rather it is this Pharisee's self-righteous attitude toward his acts of devotion. He's using his prayer time to strengthen his sanctimony by comparing his spiritual condition to this tax collector over here, speaking as if he wasn't in the room, knowing he was there the whole time. And drawing the conclusion that not only can this guy not carry my prayer shawl, but by comparison, I'm looking pretty good to you, God. This Pharisee may have been better than the tax collector in every respect in his life, and yet the minute he despised that tax collector, the minute he put all of his hopes for justification on his own efforts alone, the minute he engaged in what I call scoreboard theology, where he compared his life to somebody else and said, hey God, look at the two of us, between the two, I think it's clear who the winner is. Scoreboard, I win. The minute he trusted that he was good enough on his own, all of those religious merit badges were for nothing. This 
is something that affects God's people even today. Brothers and sisters, it is very tempting for us to engage in justification by comparison. Taking our lives and our good deeds and comparing them to somebody else and saying, hey God, we look pretty good by comparison. So all we need to do is just keep on doing what we're doing. It's very tempting for us to engage in scoreboard theology. David Brooks, in a March 21st, 2011 article in the New York Times, talked about, uh, the article was named, The Modesty Manifesto, incidentally. He talked about a phenomenon he says is going on in our country today. He said it's a phenomenon of the magnification of the self. He offered up some observations to prove his point. Among those observations are these. When pollsters ask people from around the world to rate themselves and their effectiveness in certain tasks, the Americans always lead the way when it comes to positive self-image. Although American students generally do very poorly on global math tests, they lead the world when it comes to self-confidence in their mathematical skills. Here's my favorite. 94%, 94% of all college professors think that they are above average teachers. 94% above average. Let's hope they're not teaching math. It seems that our Self-analysis may not be as foolproof as we think it is, including our spiritual self-analysis. We may not be as far ahead on the spiritual scoreboard as we think we are. <clears throat> at any rate, by looking at this parable, it's clear to see that we are not justified by outdoing other people. Neither are we justified by putting God in our debt. Now, the people that Jesus is addressing in this parable, the ones he talked about in verse 9, those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous, these are people who believed that their rightness before God was something they had earned through their good deeds, that God owed this to them. The Pharisee here is praying in effect, Hey God, I know you accept me. You have to accept me. Look at all the good stuff I'm doing. Man, you sure are lucky to have me on the team. An emphasis on spiritual self-reliance leads to an attitude of self-righteousness, which then leads to the practice of entitlement, which leads people into the false belief and the sinful belief that it's actually possible for somebody to put God in their debt. That God owes them something for who they are and the good things that they do. David Head, many years ago, wrote a satirical piece entitled, A Prayer of Confession for Those Who Are Okay. It goes like this in part. Benevolent and ever-giving parent, we have occasionally had a few minor lapses in judgment, but they're really not our fault. We're actually doing pretty good right now. We might even say above average. Grant that we may continue in our happy and harmless lives and that we might retain our self-respect. And we ask all of this through the unlimited tolerance that we have a right to expect from you. Amen. Now that was meant as a humor piece. But the fact of the matter is, this in fact is a prayer that a lot of folks are praying today who actually think they've got an IOU from God. The October 21st, 2013 edition of Christianity Today carries an interview with Dr. Billy Graham in which he talks about his new book, My Reason for Hope, Salvation. In that interview, Dr. Graham says this, I was burdened to write a book that address the issue of easy believism. There's a mindset out there today that says if you believe in God and you do good things, then you're going to heaven. It's clear that there are folks out there who believe that they deserve to be right before God because of all the good things that they're doing. 
I'm good, so I'm good with God. He owes me. And yet, if we look at this parable, it's very clear that that's not the way things work in the kingdom of God. This Pharisee is the poster child for people who think that justification, being right before God, is simply a matter of being so good that it causes God to owe you one. I've got to be free of look how good he is. And yet, for all of his goodness, the Pharisee still misses the mark. No, we're not justified by putting God in our debt either. So what's the answer? How are we made right before God? If it's not by outdoing somebody else, if it's not by putting God in our debt, how does it work? The good news, and it is good news for us this morning is that we are justified, made right before God by faith through grace. And as we acknowledge our true state before God, Donald Blesh wrote this. He said the laxity and the sinfulness of the publican is just as repugnant to God as the self-righteousness of the Pharisee. It's not the publican as such, but rather the repentant publican who is being praised. Look at the prayer of this publican again. Did you hear what he said? There was no uh, listing of all the good deeds he'd done. There was no attempt to try to make himself look better by comparison. There was no attempt to put God in his debt. There was a simple confession of wrongdoing and a plea for the mercy, the goodness, and the grace of God. That is the way that leads to being made right. That is the way that leads to justification. And you and I need to understand. If you don't hear anything else I ever say, listen to this. We are not made right before God because of what we do or how we look in comparison to somebody else. Other people's spiritual lives are not the standard by which we are measured. We are measured by the righteousness of God. And there is no way we're ever going to put God in our debt. Nothing you can do will make God owe you a blessed thing. As Paul tells us, all of our righteousness are as filthy rags to him. No, the way to justification, the way to being made right, is the way the public is the way that leads to confession and repentance and accepting of God's unmerited grace. You know the sad thing in this story? The sad thing is that by the standards he chose, this Pharisee never had a chance of achieving the goal he was looking for. He was never going to make it that way. The only way he could have made it was to go the way of the Lord. Tim Keller, in his book, Generous Justice, talks about a definition that he'd come up with for the term that Jesus used, the poor in spirit from the Beatitudes. He said, it means this. It means knowing that you are in debt before God. So much so that you can't even begin to redeem yourself. God's free gift offered to you at infinite price to Him was the only way you were going to be saved. This is the path that the publican chose. And because of that, Jesus tells us He is the man that went home right before God that day. Do you understand what good news that really is? And it is good news. We need to understand that this is a free gift of God's grace. And so many people out there today are missing out on this free gift because they're trying to work for it on their own. They're trying to earn something they don't have a chance of earning on their own. All they have to do is put their hands in the street. Donald Miller, in his book, Blue Light Jazz, talked about an experience he had. He was talking to a spiritual friend. He was offering up some prayer requests to this spiritual friend. They, they shared prayer requests with one another. And he talked about his friends and his family who were going through some times and needing some prayer. And then the friend asked him to share some of his own struggles. Don, what's going on with you? What can we pray with you about? And Don refused. He said, I don't really have anything to offer up because my, my situation is not nearly as bad as everybody else's. <coughs> and he said his friend said something to him that struck him to the very core. His friend said to him, Don, you are not above the charity of God. God said he went home and he realized in that instant that he had received a revelation. That what he was doing was not noble, but rather it was prideful. He wrote, it wasn't that I was concerned about my friends and family more than myself. The truth was, I thought I was above the grace of God. 
And that's the good news, I think, that needs to be taken away from this text and from the gospel itself. Thank God none of us are beyond the goodness and the charity of God. Not even Dr. Sheldon Cooper. We don't need to. Indeed, we cannot rely on being made right through our own efforts alone. It's never going to happen. What we've got to do is to accept God's gift of salvation by faith through grace with thanksgiving. That's how you get there. Jim Collins is a business writer. We're going to look off from good to great. He's got a saying that goes something like this. Good is the enemy of great. There may be some truth to that in the business sense. I don't think maybe so. But as I read this text this week, and as I dealt with this, it came to me that those who are trying to be good to earn God's greatness in and of themselves are going down a spiritual path that's going to lead to nowhere famous. So, with respect to Mr. Collins' saying, and in light of our text and the good news we've heard today, let me paraphrase him and say this. Good is the enemy of grace. Don't worry about being good enough. You accept God's grace. Let God's grace work in and through you. And the goodness will come through His grace. Not through anything we do. Lest anyone should boast. Those who have ears, let them hear. Thanks be to God for His word to us this day. Amen. Say amen one more time, God. Amen. amen. So let's, as a people of God, as children of God, who are redeemed by His grace alone, and as a family, remember who we are as a church. Remember our identity by singing the hymn that was written for this church that we gather, grow, and go together. Let's all stand up. Sing we gather. We gather in your name. We grow together in love. Then we go out in the same. The work of faith to be done. And you will walk by our side as Father, Spirit, and Son. For we will gather, grow, and go. With joys that we share in thanks for all you have done, we come with burdens to bear in faith that healing will come. We are the body of Christ, the hands and feet of your Son, so we will gather, grow, and go. Lord, we will gather. You guys may know I end up struggling with lyrics the most during worship. The worship team laughs at me all the time because I just sing the wrong words. And it's so bad that Paul, in his awesomeness, made a teleprompter that's sitting right up here. And I still just, it's about grace. See? This is what I'm saying. Who you bring hope to the hopeless and light to those in the darkness from death to life? Now I am alive. Oh, you give peace to the restless and. 
Thanks a lot. We'll see you.